Lord, sometimes it's just hard for us to step back away from all the things that inform our thinking. Even as we study your word, our culture, our economics, our politics, our age, everything affects the way we understand it. And Lord, we need you to help us, that you by your spirit would bring your word to be what you say. That it would be able to divide between the soul and the spirit and to judge our thoughts and intentions. To really show us, to really cut us loose from the kind of thinking that gets in the way of seeing things your way. So help us today and help us to not resist that, but to welcome your, that division, that cutting away of those things which get in the way of living freely for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I came into the early service and it was full and I thought, these people are beating the heat. But you guys did okay because it hasn't gotten terrible in here, but I guess later it's supposed to get really exciting. But then tomorrow, VBS, obviously we have VBS starting, and some of you don't know this, but I teach an adult class for VBS every day, 9 to noon, and uh, you want to come for part of that, we'll talk about, in VBS, we'll talk about what the kids are learning, and then I'll have a lot of time for you to ask questions, and, and then of course there are snacks, that's always a plus. Snacks are good. And we meet in the upper level, so it's a good thing it's not going to be super hot today. You know, we've been doing the study through the Sermon on the Mount, and I like to do teach through the Sermon on the Mount every few years because it's kind of the discipleship um, outline for what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. And... Uh, it does deal with coming to know Jesus and the Beatitudes. The pieces of repentance are really there. But most of the Sermon on the Mount is to inform us and instruct us how to live our lives as followers of Jesus. But it is really hard to hear it because the Sermon on the Mount is so radical. It really is. It's What happens to us a lot of times is we begin to read it and we begin to like make all of these accommodations and well this actually means this and this means this and all of it is oftentimes being watered down and informed by where we find ourselves in history where we find ourselves uh, in our own lives perhaps what our politics are what our maybe what our country we have grown up in might be and what can end up happening a lot of times is we end up kind of with such a scrapped out version of this, what this is really teaching that basically you end up with Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, which is do unto others the way you'd have, you know, as you'd want to have them done to you, you know, the golden rule, and pretty much the Sermon on the Mount becomes nothing. It's been fascinating to me as I read uh, different commentators, especially a lot of commentators wrote about the Sermon on the Mount that are from Britain and from England and from other countries, some from Germany uh, during the Reformation. It's a fascinating thing to see how they folded in their thinking about the you know about living under a monarchy or living under various princes went into their thinking about the Sermon on the Mount, just kind of like we do. We make these adaptations as we interpret the Scripture, and the reason we do it is because to really listen to what Jesus says, to walk it back and not try and interpret it through our own grid, is super challenging. As a matter of fact, the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, to a great extent, it is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that in part got him killed. Because everything Jesus taught was so other than the thinking of their day. 
the culture of their day, the economics of their day. It was, you know, you got to remember, Jesus grew up in a culture where people thought if you were rich, that made you smart and made you better and made you more blessed. And so then Jesus taught this. Now, of course, Jesus gave himself willingly on the cross for our salvation. But a lot of the people arrayed against Jesus, just about everybody in the spectrum, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the only thing they could get along on is that we had to get rid of Jesus because what he was teaching was upsetting everything. He's turned the world upside down. And that's because even really good religious people, people like us, people that sit in your seats and people that sit in this seat, can get distracted from God pretty easily. You don't have to try and get distracted from God. Life is distracting. The world we live in, the, the ocean of this world that we're swimming in affects us. It's like we're like fish. It's going through our gills all the way through. And what happens to us when we get distracted from God, we don't necessarily realize it. Do you remember in the book of Revelation, he said that the church said, we are rich and have need of nothing. And then Jesus's perspective on the very same people who, in their viewpoint, we are rich and we don't need anything. He said, well, I say you are wretched and naked and blind. You talk about a juxtaposition of how we see ourselves versus how he sees us. Because Jesus sees it how even good people, good church-going religious people, hearts can begin to turn a little bit. And then their hearts begin to burn for lesser things. It happens. You know, our hearts can get so passionate about other things. We're not very passionate about God. We're passionate about our politics. We're passionate about our opinions about Diet, we could be passionate about sports. You never see people so get spun up about sports. But we're not nearly so passionate about Jesus. Sometimes it's a hybrid. We kind of mix them all up. It's funny how people will, you know, begin to mix the gospel into their, their concoction. And it's hard to know. Are they really passionate about their opinion or about the gospel? But there is nothing that will distract our heart faster than money. It's just a fact. Wealth, stuff. It gets a hold of our heart. It really does. It doesn't take very much. We move from needs to wants to desires, right? And isn't it easy from how our needs can, our wants can suddenly become needs and our and then if we push it a little bit further and talk a little bit further to ourselves, our desires become needs, right? I was, you know, when I go to Olympia, sometimes I have some business in Olympia, I'll go and I'll, um, I went. And so if I have a little bit of time, I like to go to Cabela's or, or to REI. And I wander around in there and look at cool stuff. I do a lot of looking, not much buying but I've been doing a lot. So I have, I, but I was thinking, I need, I need, I need something. I need to get these hiking boots. And you know, hiking boots are not cheap. I mean, I can remember buying a used car years ago for not that much more than that. <laughs> and so, uh, so I was in there and I, I found these boots and I tried them on and they felt great, you know, because my other boots, here's the problem. I have this pair, particular type of boot I like, but the, the last pair I got, they just weren't holding up. Like, they, 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 everything's fine on them except for this sole is coming unglued on the front. And I was like, man, I really like these and they, they work well, they don't leak, but the sole's coming off them. And... Um, so I'm in there, I'm thinking, I need to get these. And then I find the super good ones, and suddenly my, my want started becoming very needy. My desire started to become very needy. And um, so I, I confess, I got a pair and I start, wore them home. 
Then I got home and I decided, I don't like these that much. So I took them back. I know this is getting to be a way longer story than it ought to be. Uh, and I took, I actually got another pair, tried those on, and I didn't like them that much. And so then I went back and I took them back because they didn't fit quite right. And then I was thinking, I was like getting focused on this. You know, I got, you know, this is a need. I mean, I don't know how I'll survive without these. I mean, I got all these hikes I got to do. I'm doing youth camp and a bunch of stuff. And then it dawned on me. I put my old boots on and I said, I kind of like these old boots. And then ingenuity happened. I got some shoe goo. Look, don't laugh. I got the shoe goo. I read, and I did an unmanly thing. I read the instructions. So I cleaned it out really good, sanded them all down. And then I shoe gooed it. And then I did a Pastor Joe special. I t got this tape. It sounds good. It's got a good name, Tenacious Tape. And I built a little tip on it, and I tightened them all back down. And now I've had to wait 72 hours. They got a cure for 72 hours. Tomorrow night, I'll get to test them out. Hopefully, the toe won't come off. But if that happens, Kevin, I'll just put some duct tape on them. They'll be okay. The handyman's <laughs> special treat. But I began, it was really funny. I started laughing about it, that how quickly my desire for the gold-plated, super deluxe, air-cooled boot suddenly became a need or the want and the reality was I probably can, I'm not trying to elicit, a, we're not taking a special offering for boots either, so this is not where I'm going, okay? I know how some of you are, but what I'm saying is, I suddenly realized I, I just really didn't need them. I could make this work, and I liked them. So it's just funny. Isn't it funny how stuff like that just gets a hold of your heart? Maybe it doesn't for you. Maybe I'm just kind of a Buddha-holic or whatever. But it's hard to be content in life. It's hard to self-limit. It is. It just is. And the more we have, the harder it is to self-limit. You know, Paul said, having food and clothing, we should learn therewith to be content. But it's hard to do it. I, I know I have a hard time. And, but Jesus recognized that if there's anything that will get you distracted from God, it'll be stuff like this. Remember he said he told the parable of the sower and he said the sower sowed the wheat, the word of God and the word went out and some fell here and some fell there. But then some fell in the thorny ground and the thorny ground, the thorns sprung up. It was producing fruit. It had some tomatoes on it and then it just choked it out. Jesus explained it to his disciples like this. He said the word is sown in the thorny ground but the worries of the world, and I'm going to talk about worry next week, because a lot of what we worry about is about stuff. How to get it, how to hang on to it, how to maintain it. The worries of the world, and then the deceitfulness of riches, and then look, look what he says, and the desire for other things. And guys, I don't know why that is so slow, but it did the same thing to me in the last service. You just gotta back it up. It's, a, it's kind of messed up. The desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Isn't that interesting? He's not talking about people who are not believers. He's talking about people who receive the word into their life, some truth of God, and the deceit, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, you know, and riches are deceitful. They tell you they make you better than other people. They tell you if you have riches that you're more secure. They tell you if you have riches, if you could just be, get a few more riches, you'd be a lot happier. That's what they tell you. The deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things choke out the word, and here's this person who was beginning to produce fruit. The fruit is choked out, and it goes away, and they're no longer fruitful. They're no longer faithful and full of the fruit of the Spirit. Because, you see, Jesus wants you and I to be so different. We are people who, no matter what's going on, we have an inner life of peace. We are contented. 
We are fruitful. That's the kind of life he has for us. He's planned for us. But I found this to be true, and maybe you guys are the exceptions, but it seems like the scripture teaches this, that the more you get, the harder this is to do. Right? To not be worried, to not let stuff get a hold of you. The more we have, the harder it is to do. Now, I, I'm not here to judge anybody or like, you know, beat up on you. I'm just saying it's harder to stay in a place of peace and contentment, communicating and living out the fruit of the Spirit, the more you have. And yet Jesus gave us some simple instructions on how to escape the distraction that especially goes along with wealth. And so I'm going to give you these four things, and I'm going to move pretty quick with it. Number one, you have to don't... He, Jesus makes it very, very clear that you don't hoard, give. Don't hoard, give. And uh, you guys ever watch that show, Hoarders? Like every... The few, I haven't watched it very much. It freaks me out too much. It kind of makes me grossed out. But... But what it does is it does make me want to, it motivates me to clean my garage. So maybe I'm ready to do another episode, huh? All this stuff. But notice what Jesus said. Jesus made it very clear. He said, he said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. In other words, he's saying, don't hoard stuff. We store up treasures on earth because we think that's going to um, make us um, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break into steel. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. It's really easy to get into this mode because in your mind you think, I might need that, right? It's like this internal uh, check in your life. You know, my mom, uh, JJ, every time I go to her house, she has this thing called a Joe bag. And it's her offloading stuff that 85, she realizes that she's not going to need. And, and so I'm pretty, I'm just polite about it, you know what I'm saying? So I went to see her the other day, and she had broken her, um, like, you know, spray thing for the hose. And I said, well, I can run over and get you one. She goes, oh, no, don't do that. And she always talks to me like this. Go over there, bend over. You know, this, is, this is my mom. She's very, very directive. And pick that bucket up. Bring it over here. Okay. It's got like six spray attachments. I mean, some of these things really probably I should put them on Craigslist as antiques. Okay. And... I go, oh, man, you're set up. So you want me to, you know, I found one that worked for her. And she said, this is lighter. And so there's five. She goes, I'm never going to need those. I'll be dead before I ever need them again. She goes, uh, you need to take those with you. Okay. And I'm, I'm kind of, okay. So I get them. In the, and then I'm thinking, yeah, that would come in handy. You know, I can put one in the, in the um, garden and one over here. I'm going to be rocking the hose. Okay. So I'm going to be the water man. So I'm, uh, I get one out, and I'm trying it out. I turn it on. It sprays me, the whole thing. Okay, it gets worse. This is a really disgusting story, okay? It had sat so long that the, the little washer inside of it had come apart, and so I decided, well, I'm going to be unlike most people. I'm going to actually try and fix something. So I took my screwdriver out. I'm trying to fix it, and I find the little washer, and I go, I had to, where am I going to find a washer like this? Nobody replaces this stuff. And I think maybe I got one in the in the hoard, uh, in the garage, in my hoard, in my hoard area. So I go out there and I'm digging around in the area where I think I might find it. This is gonna, you're gonna think less of me. You know what I found? A whole nother spray nozzle I didn't know I even had. <laughs> it worked even, and I was like, this must have been what I bought last time. I couldn't find one. And yet Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor thieves break in and steal. You know, the interesting thing that Jesus is saying, he's really giving us a piece of practical advice. The only thing that you can't lose 
is what you give away. The only thing that you don't have to be stressed out about and worried about are things that you've given away to other people in some way. And you know, he says, he says, be very careful about this. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven because it's in those places you will not, you will learn it. Now I've used this illustration before, but I want to do it again. I need a volunteer. Maybe, um, let's see. I won't pick on you again because I'm always picking on you. David, can you do this for me? Can you help me out? Okay. Would you take this in just a second at my command? And all I'm going to need you to do is just, it's going to get tangled up a little bit. It's okay. I just want you to walk out that door and keep walking until you run out of tread. Not yet. See this? On the end of this, there's a little red dot. Okay? That's a dot. And let's call that your lifespan. That's time. That's the, that's the life that you've got. And all the, go ahead, David, start walking, man. Okay? All the rest of this string theory I got here is all the rest of this, and don't choke, uh, keep going, go all the way out until you run out of I just didn't want to choke Leslie. Um, keep going, keep going, keep going, off belay. Okay, go ahead. That's good. So all the rest of that, and that's not long enough, right, because it has an infinite end. That's, that's eternity. And we all say, oh, we believe it. Quit pulling on it, Danny. Um, we quit pulling my string, Danny. Okay. Um, we all say we believe in eternity. We believe, you know, eternal life or everlasting life. But you know what? So much of our focus, Jesus is saying, you're focused on this red dot. And you're not investing really almost anything in the one that can't be taken away. Where neither moth nor rust corrupt or thieves break in and steal. It's really. Just a bad management plan, isn't it? To be completely used up. You know, he's, Danny's messing with me. He's stepping on the rope, okay? And uh, thank you. Very good. You know, if you think about, think about how we very, very seldom really live our lives, especially when it comes to our stuff, with the eye on eternity. A lot of times we'll think about it a little bit, like, oh, I want that person to go to heaven. But Jesus is making it very clear. You need to think about your stuff in terms of eternity as well. Because he's trying to do us a favor. He's saying, why are you investing everything you have in that dot? For He's saying, it's secure if you leave it with me. You know... Um, I've often wondered this. It seems kind of strange that um, you can bring it back one. There you go. Um, <laughs> it seems kind of strange that why is it that God, like some of you are, and this is not a bad thing. Some of you have an abundance. Maybe certain groups of Christians in certain parts of the world have more than others. Like America, a lot of American believers have much more abundance than people that live in other Christians and other people in general, but Christians particularly, that live in other parts of the world. Why is that? Why did God give that to you just so you could like hoard it and pile it up, create a dynasty of some kind? Is that the purpose? You know, Paul says something, and it's not some left-wing crazy economics. Paul just says this is, when he wrote to the Corinthians, he was talking about believers that were in Jerusalem, Jewish believers, and these Gentile believers in Corinth. He was taking an offering because the Jewish believers and the Jews in general in Jerusalem were starving because they didn't have, there was a famine. Paul was taking this offering and Paul made this point to them, which I thought was really fascinating. It's unlike anything else you find anywhere else in script, in anywhere in ancient literature until you come to Paul. He says, and this wasn't mandated, it was voluntary, but he said, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need. You know what Paul is saying? God blessed you with an abundance. When you have an abundance, he didn't just give it to you so that you could like stash it someplace where moth and rust corrupt. He gave it to you so that in your abundance, you could supply the need of those who have less. 
so that their abundance may become a supply to your need, so that there may be equality. You know what he's saying? This can work. As believers, somebody has more, they help meet the need of the other. And the other person, maybe one day they're going to have something, or they're going to have an abundance of something or some area where they can give that to you. This is really the reason why there's this disparity. The disparity of wealth is not really the problem. The disparity of generosity is the problem. That's the problem. We're storing it up in the wrong place. So don't hoard, give. You know the great thing about giving? The only things that you take out of, take to heaven with you are the things that you give away. And the only things you don't worry about is what ultimately ends up belonging to God when you give over the ownership. So don't hoard, give. Second thing, don't value things over souls. And by the way, that means don't value things over your own soul or over the souls of your kids or over the souls of other people. A friend of mine, well, actually, he was a preacher I knew. He's dead now, Adrian Rogers. But he asked this question to me and some other guys. And it was really kind of, I, I won't tell you how I answered it. I didn't do all that great. But he made this question. He was presenting this saying, when it comes to your stuff, I want you to think about this for a second. Now, just, just think about it for a minute. He said, is this true or false for you as a follower of Jesus? Think about it, young people. Think about this is the, think hard about this. True or false, make all the money you can, but be honest. What do you think? True or false? Make all the money you can, but be honest. True or false? Is that on? Is that right? Is that correct? Is that biblical? Because think about it. There are lots of people that don't believe in God at all that are making all the money they can, honestly. So, what about God? You're going to make all the money you can, but you never have time for church. You never go have time to to really. Uh, do anything for God, you never see God at all. Make all the money you can, but be honest. Or what about your family? There are people that make all the money they can, honestly, but they neglect their marriage. They neglect their family. They live for the almighty dollar, not for people. They don't give. Make all the money you can, but do it honestly. That's not a biblical idea. That's a very much a part of our cultural idea. You see, we don't ask the question, what can I do with this? How can I invest this in, in some way good? What, is, what do I need? And what is going to ultimately make me happy or make other people happy? You know, it's interesting, the book of Proverbs, I, I read through the book of Proverbs. It says the exact thing that Jesus says. It says, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. He says, don't burn out your whole life to make as much money as you can, even if it's honestly. As a matter of fact, don't spend all your time thinking about how you can make money. Don't cease your consideration of it. And here's why he said it. It's very important. Proverbs 23.5 says, when you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. In other words, money talks. It says goodbye. The fact is, is that did you know that all of your money, you know what's going to happen to it? You're going to leave it all. You're not going to have any when you leave this world, except for what you give away. See, this really isn't a message about trying to get you to give. This is a message about trying to get you to think differently about stuff, about what is real. Because you know what's real? You know, life is not a two-hour movie that you watch it and it's great and then after two and a half hours, you, you, you know, it's not like that. that it, it's, it's real. Life is real. Life is when the movie's over and you know what is real? It's what lasts. That's real. What really lasts. That's why Jesus said, 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you know where your treasure is, where the things that you really care about, that you know what, what you really care about is what you really value. What you really care about is what you focus on. You focus on things that matter to you. And they will matter to you. Like, for example, people say, well, I just wish I cared more about that. Well, give. Invest in it. Invest some time in it. You'll probably, it'll change your heart. You will, your heart will follow what you invest in. I thought it was interesting. There's one of these super rich dudes, like radio, TV, talk guy. And he is so rich, he was complaining to his friends recently that he didn't know how to spend all of his extra money. He had so much extra money. And so you know what he got into? Do you know what a black Maybach 5-7-S is? Do you know what that is? It's like some super fancy handmade car. I don't know what they do with it. They, you know, mine the metal out of by hand someplace. I don't know what they do. But this car costs a half a million dollars with tax and stuff and tags, you know. Costs a half a million. Fully loaded, of course. For half a million, you'd think it was fully loaded, right? This guy, this radio talk show dude, he has 12 of them. Because he doesn't know what to do with his money. I, I want to tell you, there are people that don't really live in the same world you live in. And yet, it's crazy that they're giving us advice, you know. You know, we're trying to think, okay, what's milk costing? And they're trying to figure out how to spend half a, you know, a billion dollars on stuff. I, I thought it was funny, too. The, uh, there was another guy. You guys know Paul Allen. He's a guy that's one of the, I don't know what he owns, all kinds of stuff. But he was having the same problem back a few years ago. And the way he solved it was some guy built a yacht, like a private yacht, you know. It was like 290 feet long. And it was the longest personal yacht in the world. So Paul Allen built one that was 330 feet long, just so he could have the longest. Maybe it was 350. I don't know. But that's like a ship, right? And guess what? They cost a million dollars a foot. You know, I know a million dollars doesn't buy what it used to, but really. And I'm not, I, I'm not like down on people like that. It's fine. I mean, look, um, the question is, that we don't really care about things that we aren't really invested in, whether it's causes or lives. And by the way, that's why a lot of people really, I know I have to struggle with this too. You know, like when you see the things on TV and, uh, uh, and you see, you know, about poor people, you know, how bad it is. I get overwhelmed. I'm like, where do I even start? What do I even do here? I mean, I, maybe I could help one person, but how do I like, handle this problem where they there's 40 you know there's a hundred thousand people here you know i'm like wow i feel like a little drop so it's easy to just defend yourself right and not invest anything at all because i it's too hard to care about it now it is true that jesus is condemning living extravagant opulent glamorous life. He really, Jesus is really not promoting, as a matter of fact, he speaks, the Bible speaks very strongly against the idea of living with conspicuous consumption without considering other people. I mean, we ought to really, as believers, always think like this. You know, I have all this stuff, or I could do this, but how could I do more to help if I lived a life that was a little more simple or modest? See, for the follower of Christ, we have a separate number of issues to deal with. We must ask, how could I live my life to do the most good for the most people for the, most, for the longest time? And by the way, folks, it really doesn't matter what you own. It sometimes matters more why you own it. It doesn't really matter why. It doesn't really matter about owning stuff. As long as it's not owning you. Do you know what I mean? Do you ever feel like your stuff owns you? Like you're just like, ugh, I got to go deal with that. So the question for you is this. Are you spontaneous in your giving? Kind of don't know what one hand is doing? Are you generous, open-handed, 
free of addiction to stuff. We live in a society, especially among Christians, sex, drugs, used to be rock and roll, but I guess that's not so bad anymore. But sex, drugs, and rock and roll, man, you know, don't do that. Uh, corruption, you know, dishonesty, that's bad. We don't want to do that. And we'll like, Christians will come out and say, we're totally down on this, you know, immorality and perversion and, and you know, dishonesty and uh, addiction, but greed is okay. Greed's the one sin in our country where it's considered kind of a virtue. It's more accepted, it's more popular, and it's more powerful. As a matter of fact, you know, people, um, we don't really have, you know, uh, materialist anonymous. <laughs> Are uh, you know, lust anonymous, lust for lust for stuff anonymous. The question we have to ask ourselves is: Do any of us know when to say enough is enough? And it's not just you. You're you you folks. I think in some ways maybe um, uh, have this more figured out. Somebody, one of you guys, sent me some link: the 15 richest preachers in America. I was shocked. Like, these preachers are worth like $40 million each, personal wealth, and make millions of dollars a year. They're like the mega rich. And um, now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that it, I think you guys are great about this. I mean, I think that pastors and staff need to be paid, you know, good, well, and to be taken care of. But do you really think a million dollars a year is an is a overkill? I sent that, I think I sent that to Scott, that link, and Scott said, I think you need to get me a raise. <laughs> I said, I don't think so, man. I think we think we're good. But you know, think about I was surprised, to be honest with you, I was surprised that there was listed some pastors that I had long, you know, like I, I thought were on the up and up that were making massive amounts of money and were worth $25, $30 million. Now, of course, I don't know what they're doing with their money. They might be, you know, doing good stuff. I know there are some pastors that have a lot of wealth, like what's the guy, Rick Warren, the guy that wrote Purpose Driven Life? He's very, very wealthy. He wrote that book and it sold like bazillion books and made millions of dollars. But you know, he's a little bit of an interesting guy. I, this is documented that he practices something called reverse tithing. He gives 90% of all of his money away all of his income, all of his wealth. He still lives in the same house. And I tried to tell the Lord he could trust me that I would do that. But, you know. Uh, <laughs> but then he reminded me that I would have to write a good book and everything, too, and I just didn't think I had it in me. Um, I'm just trying to tell you, isn't it crazy that this is, this is such a test, not just for you, but for people in leadership, too. And some of these, of course, People on TV are really pretty scary. And they're really, but here's the thing. You got these bazillionaires that are like um, governing the way we're supposed to navigate our Christian lives. Uh, that needs to cause us to reflect a little bit sometimes. You know, and that brings me to the third thing. Don't focus on, if you want to avoid the distraction of stuff, don't focus on the seen, but on the unseen. You know, Jesus says it's so important that you really have the right focus. That you, that the way you look at the world will affect the way, it'll affect your whole internal life. Like what you end up getting, focused. have you guys ever done this? Like you were looking for something? Probably like me in my boots, but you were looking for like, okay. Um, uh, have you ever, guys ever done this? Like you're maybe thinking about buying a car or a truck and pretty soon all of a sudden all you see is that stuff. All you do, everywhere you drive, you see that kind of car. Everywhere you drive, you see that truck. Oh, there's another one of those trucks. There's a part of your brain, did you know, that actually enables you to filter out certain things. And Jesus kind of tells us, um, uh, there you go. Um, Jesus tells us, that the eye is the lamp of the body. That means what you're focusing on, what you're looking at. Let's try that. There you go. The eye is the lamp of the body. 
So then if your eye is clear, that means you have the right perspective. You have the right thinking. You, the lens is not distorted. Your whole body will be full of light. You'll have God, you'll see things God's way. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great the darkness. You see, we have to look at what we look at. We have to catch ourselves and say, what am I getting so focused on this? You ever notice how we can get so focused on one thing or the other, get so passionate, like I said before? We have to look at what you look at, because guess what? You look like what you look at. That's what fills your life. If it's all about stuff and holding on to stuff and getting stuff, that's what you're going to look like. And that's why you have to intentionally look for the invisible value in other people. You know, a lot of the most, the things that are going to last, the things that really are valuable are things that can't be bought. They can be paid for, but they can't be bought. In your own life, in your relationships, in your kids, in your grandkids, in your relationship with God, in your own heart. Look for, focus on the seen, not on the seen, but the unseen. And then, you know, sometimes we are so practical that we don't really realize what God, that we don't really see what God might be trying to do. And then, don't serve things, serve God. This is the last point. I'm just about done, but let me just say this. Don't serve things, serve God. Because the Bible doesn't say it's just hard um, to serve God and money. He says it's impossible. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. There we go. You just can't. You cannot serve God in wealth. He doesn't say you can't have it. He doesn't say you can't use it. He says you can't serve it. It's not possible. It's not sort of, kind of. It's difficult. He says it's impossible. You see, when it comes to wealth, you cannot have a divided heart about this. You have to have a singular heart. You cannot let it guide your life and direct your life and motivate your life and focus your life. If you do, you can't, won't be able to follow the Lord. This is a, this is a real tension. You say, well, you know, I, I don't really like that. This is a tension that Christians have to live with. It's a reality that you have to sort through and think hard about. You cannot serve God in wealth. Think about it. When somebody says that, Jesus is saying, you can't have it both ways. It's either or. Your allegiance must be to God only. That must guide your life above everything. And this is hard for us. You know, those first generations of Christians really understood it, and the Apostle Paul understood it, that very quickly there were new Gospels that came about. You guys ever watch, like, uh, some of the TV guys on their TV? They're like, you know, God wants all of you to be rich. God wants all of you to be healthy all the time. You know, uh, God wants... And, of course... What's the deal with that? Those guys that teach that stuff, they're getting rich. Of course, the way it works is if you want to be rich, send me money and seed faith money and you'll get a bunch of money. You'll go out and there'll be money coming out of your your um, mailbox, $100 bills falling out of it, whatever. And um, But you know something? As a matter of fact, my friend who's from Africa, Victor Kawanga, he, his church had one of these TV evangelist guys come down there and uh, give them $10,000 for their church, okay? He, the guy flew his whole, they were doing a TV show, and so they wanted to make sure they got it on TV. So he flew his whole group and plane and his whole um, film crew to the Zambia, to Africa, to record the event of him giving them the $10,000 so it could be on TV. And Victor said... It was quite a deal. You know, he said it in his African way. It was quite a deal. And he said, um, he said, but you know what was really more interesting 
Brother Joe? I said, what, Victor? He said, do you know how much it costed them to park the airplane for four days on the tarmac? I said, no. He says, $90,000. It cost him $90,000 to fly down there and um, give him $10,000. And I said, well, Victor, why didn't you guys just tell him uh, to not to stay home and to send you 100 Gs. He said, in Africa, $10,000 is $10,000 more than nothing. (laughs) He kind of understood how the whole thing rolled. You know, there's all that stuff that's really easy to happen, and I can't pretend that I understand all the inner plays of that, but Paul wrote to those early Christians. He understood how these different Gospels these different priorities mixed in with the gospel would change. He said, he said in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, but I'm afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray. Your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Everything you do in life, everything you're learning in church, everything you're holding on to or giving, everything needs to feed one primary focus, that you love God. That it helps you love Jesus more. I don't know what totally will do that, but I do know this. If you make that your priority, you will not let the serpent deceive you into thinking you can have it both ways, but you will have it in your mind. Your mind will not be led astray from the simplicity of purity of just loving Jesus. And when you get that, I think you get most of the rest of it right. So the question you have to always ask when it comes to wealth, how to keep from being distracted by it, how does this thing I'm doing honor God? Because you know what? You can't take it with you. Of course, unless you give it away. And it always begs the question, what is my security really in? You know... Some of these financial planners, they mean really well, but they're always telling people, you know, you need to have all this financial security. Let me tell you, there's only one financial security. That's the Lord. And you could spend all your time worrying, which I would, I want to tell you, the reason why Jesus told his disciples, do not worry, is because you worry. And we'll talk more about that next time. Let's pray together, would you? Lord, it's hard for us to really hear this. It's going to be really, really easy for many to just walk out of here and go back to their well-oiled, well-worn grooves of thinking. But you want to free us. You want to cut us loose to become the most contented, peaceful, generous, loving people. Followers of you that you can say, do this and we'll do it. Everything's in the open hand. So, Lord, help us. It is hard. And help us to be responsive to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And guys, don't use those next steps, okay, Matt? Just let me take it from here. They're defective. I'd like you to take this card as we get ready for our Lord's Supper. And maybe put your name on it and maybe a a prayer request. Maybe this is particularly a difficult area for you and you just need to be praying about, you need to be prayed for. Maybe you worry about this a lot and we'll talk with a lot about that next week because I got news for you. If you do not get this area of your life um, in line with the Lord, you will be worrying all the time. You'll be a worry, worrisome person. You'll always be fretting and anxious. Put your name on it. And then there's some ways you could respond to this. Number one, I am turning from sin to Jesus as Lord. You know, the place you got to start is with the math. You can't serve God and stuff. You have to serve him. You have to surrender to him. You're going to turn from sin, from the things that keep you from God, to Jesus Christ as Lord and serve him. And you need to do that today. Number two, I am turning from greed to generosity. There's only one good, there's only one way to deal with greed, practice generosity. You just practice it until you get good at it. And then thirdly, I commit to value souls over stuff. Man, I would tell you, be that person 
that takes that, looks at the invisible, the investment. And then I'm turning from serving stuff to serving God alone. You know, don't, you can't serve God and money and wealth. It's okay to have it, but don't serve it. You, you serve at his pleasure and all that stuff's for his pleasure. It all belongs to him. If we can get free of this, think about how much God can do with us, how much he can use us without all this, you know, equivocating and arguing.